Hello, I'm delighted to testify to what God has done in my life and I hope it serves as an invitation to get to know him as a father and a friend. I was brought up in a Christian home with a doctor for a dad and a loving nurse for a mum. Church was a regular feature of my week and I gained a really good understanding of God as creator, father, friend and saviour. My journey to faith is much like Paul the Apostle's famous conversion on the road to Emmaus, only it's a very different road and there are no bright lights or power trip involved. It's a journey from places of insecurity and doubt to a place of light and acceptance. So I'm going to share my journey in three stages, my selfish and anxious wanderings from God, my turning back to God and then my being persuaded by the power of prayer. I'm not a big reader now, but I grew up as a child having lots of exposure to the Bible and witnessing and experiencing the love of being part of a church family. But my first uh, wanderings from God were in my mind. I first questioned my inherited beliefs at school during a philosophy course and then on Sundays in youth group. I was one of five young people at the church that I attended and my youth group leader, a PhD theology student, created a really open, helpful and gracious environment to discuss these questions. I appreciate how hard it is now that I'm leading a youth group myself. During this time in 1991, I attended a Billy Graham event at Murrayfield and I took my first step of faith there. In front of church friends, I stepped forward for prayer and gained a copy of Luke's Gospel, Breaking Free, that I still have today. I recognised my sins, the things that separate me from God, and I turned back to God, committing to live with him and for him. Well, whether it was because I was still under the wings of my parents or lacked the maturity to seek God's guidance, I found trusting God with my life and with my life decisions very difficult. I was anxious and I feared failure. At 17, after months of deliberation over which course to take and where to study, I left for the University of St Andrews. I wasn't alone, of course. I was accompanied by several school friends and God. In week two, I'd been feeling down about joining many clubs and societies, but not really meeting anyone that I could relate to, even after a cheeky beer or two. I remember praying to God about it, not knowing what to expect, what I really felt, or what I needed. And later that day, I received a knock on the door of my room and was invited to a barbecue with a short chat about faith. Skeptical and shy, I went along and was amazed to meet so many Christians at this Christian Union Social. I'm grateful for that invitation to this day and for the friendships that I made at the barbecue and in the two years in which I went to the Christian Union. But in second year, I asked myself if attending church twice a day on a Sunday and multiple Christian meetings during the week really was the offer of breaking free that I'd signed up for in 1991. Was I just doing the God thing because it was was cool and because it was a good excuse to meet girls? I began asking more questions of my faith itself, insecure that God could love me. Why was I so anxious even when I had faith? What possessed me to keep so busy yet spend so little time with God? I suffered what we now called FOMO or fear of missing out. But God was also reminding me that it's not the healthy that need a doctor. So I wanted to meet real people where they were at, spend time with them, serve and be a witness of God's love and grace. Well, of course, that was well-intentioned, but it didn't quite go to plan. I found freedom in other ways. I broke away from my safe group of similar friends, made more liberal friends, tried to suppress my thoughts and took up sports, drinking, threw myself into work to avoid facing up to God. I travelled, worked, studied with others, but I largely hid my faith. My eyes were open to the world, but I watched the apparent happiness of others enviously from a place of misery, isolation and confusion. And my wanderings hurt others too. For example, I courted a a good friend, but then dated another. I drifted from God. Things reached a turning point in my third year at university. I took a breath and returned to an independent Baptist church and was welcomed back by patient and loving friends that I'd cast aside over the years. After that service, I retired to my room. In some despair, my mind filled with questions without answers. A heart full of regrets with no way to clear them. A life of unconscious and unconscious sin that I hadn't faced up to, and I placed before the only God in person that could do anything about it.
I sat with a notebook and wrote out questions and in retrospect wrote a pretty messy, emotional, barely rational conversation to God. In the early hours, I prayed to God for relief and redemption from those lists of insecurities and questions in my mind. And I remember waking up late the next morning with a clear head, an inexplicable peace, knowledge of God's sovereignty over the unknowns that I'd wrestled with just a few hours before. I also recognised that I was unique in God's eyes, and it was okay to be unique in the eyes of others too. I belonged to God and I no longer needed to be a prisoner to my mind or the, to, the bound, to be bound by the sins of the past, the present or the future. And mad as it sounds, I really do believe that. Nothing is too, is too difficult for God, nothing is unknown. No lonely, remote, dark or scary place is too far from him either. I might not have a record in drugs, theft, murder or divorce, but you know, greed and jealousy and anxiety and selfishness took me and it could, could take you to the same place, this experience of being cut off from God, like rejecting a friend or ignoring your father, was real. It's not been plain sailing since that moment, of course. In London, I struggled to find a church family. In Chile, I struggled in our early years of marriage. I got comfortable with things that separated me from God and strained my relationship with Rachel. That confidence sometimes leads to arrogance. That newly found confidence sometimes led to arrogance, and I continue to, to lack empathy. And in the heady commercial work in which I have worked the last few years, I struggle to, with greed and envy. But I want to encourage you to keep it real with God, particularly in prayer. As is evident from this testimony, I often overthink and worry, but when I've faced up to God or have no choice but to trust him, such as when our daughter Lydia was born prematurely, he has not failed me. Thankfully, God has protected me from making some pretty terrible mistakes, and he's gracious. So too is my wife, Rachel. And I'm assured by God's promises to love no matter how I feel, to forgive me no matter how far I've strayed from him. He always has our best interests in mind, even although my interests and my choices often differ. So, to recap, my life of selfish and anxious wanderings has also seen me turn back to God, and now see the power of prayer.